there's currently over 25 million cars on Britain's roads and every year the manufacturers sell over 2 million new cars. So it's obviously in their interests that motoring journalists devote as many column inches and as much television time as possible to their new products. Now to follow that aim, the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders holds a test day here at Millbrook every year. The object is that uh, journalists jump in as many new cars as possible and find out what they're all about. So amongst the Exotica, what's uh, claimed to be the cheapest car in Britain? Tim Slaughter, what is it? This is a Perodo Nipper, which is uh, made in Malaysia. Uh, has an 853 cylinder engine, five doors, and is an ideal city car runabout, equally at home, you know, for runs on the open road as well. And uh, the, this tag of cheapest car, what are you actually selling this one for? This is uh, £4,999. I mean, that does sound ridiculously cheap. I mean, what, what sort of, uh, uh, what, what are you missing against, a, 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 you know, a car of twice the price? Well, you're not really missing missing a great deal. I mean, the main advantage of this car is that it's built in Malaysia and the the exchange rate is excellent at the moment with Malaysia and we're actually passing that on to the customer. So we're selling the car at a, at a sensible price because of the exchange rate. So from 850ccs and three cylinders and £5,000 to the other end of the spectrum, Nissan Skyline GTR, £50,000, 280 brake horsepower, four-wheel drive, four-wheel steer. They're only going to bring 100 of these supercars into the country this year. And to demonstrate it here at Millbrook, saloon car and sports car racer extraordinaire, Chris Goodwin. Right, off we go, Long to 60 and... Uh... Oh look, we've done it. This is the Skyline GTR, so what you get for your money, be quick. Motor, what they call an intelligent car in that it uh, sorts out a lot, a lot of your problems for you. Four wheel drive, four wheel steer, and a car that will uh, bias the, uh, the power front to rear as and when it sees fit really. So um, we're going around the handling circuit here at Millbrook pretty quickly. But it's relatively easy. Get up to about 100 miles an hour going into this first corner. You can see ABS brakes help as we're braking into here. But we're powering through that corner in second gear. Slight sideways movement there of the car but it, again it corrects itself and we're fully on the throttle while it's doing that. So. Uh, I can just concentrate on trying to make the thing go quickly. Volkswagen announced the Mark IV version of the Golf late last year. This is the first time we've seen right-hand drive versions of the car and they'll be launched on the UK market within the next month or so. The Volkswagen design philosophy has been very much evolution and not revolution and the car is unmistakably a Golf follows very similar lines to the old model, although it is a brand new car from the wheels up. It's a bigger car than the old model, there's more elbow and shoulder room and more leg room in the back. But you can't help feeling a little disappointed that they weren't just a little bit more adventurous. Still has the same feel of solidity and build quality, very very safe, predictable handling as you'd expect for a car that uh, is number one bestseller in Europe. Simon Small, you've been associated with uh, the import of Japanese cars over the what, the last 20 years? You've seen them come and go. Will, will these micro cars really catch on in Britain? Well, whether we like it or not, we're all being encouraged to move towards smaller cars for environmental reasons, uh, pollution reasons and so on. And I think gradually people are going to look more closely at using smaller cars because of, of, of uh, the traffic situation that we now experience on our roads here, uh, because of pollution, because of the cost of fuel and so on. I mean, so will, will, will they just be town cars or, or will people actually use them you know, as everyday cars? I think people will gradually use them as everyday cars. I mean, certainly if you live, to, live and work in central London, for example, a car like these Daihatsus makes sense. Now, Mark Quinn, Managing Director of Kia, Korean company, and we appear to be sitting in a Lotus Elan. 
Well, you may think we're sitting in a Lotus Elan, Chris, but in fact we're sitting in a Kia sports car. But you're quite right, it originally was uh, produced uh, by Lotus uh, in the UK and uh, Kia subsequently bought the rights for Kia and now produce it as the Kia sports car. So uh, we're pleased to have it in the UK. L Lotus always said they never made any money out of the Elan. Are you, you going to uh, change all that? I'm not sure whether I can comment on whether Lotus made money or not. I'm sure they did reasonably well out of it. But uh, no, as, as far as we're concerned, it gave us uh, an added bit of spice to the range. As you know, Kia, uh, the name Kia in the UK is not that well known. And bringing this car back into the UK actually has helped us to raise the level of people's knowledge about Kia as a product. Now, you can't get more up to date than this. This is the Bentley Arnage introduced just two days ago at a special launch at Le Mans. It's uh, the Bentley version of the new Rolls-Royce Silver Seraph. Now, I've never driven one of these, but my son has the advantage over me. The uh, Group Supergrass were uh, allowed to drive the new Rolls-Royce here at Millbrook quite a few weeks ago, and he couldn't resist phoning me up and going, nah, 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 nah. So now it's my turn. Like the Rolls-Royce, the new Bentley is powered by a 4.4-litre V8 engine, twin-turbocharged, 350 brake horsepower. It's actually a BMW engine, but it's been de developed specially for the car with the help of uh, both Rolls-Royce engineers and Cosworth. The result is something that's got spectacular power, but still retains the silence and smoothness that you associate with these cars. As you'd expect for £145,000, very, very nice inside. You may find this colour scheme a bit garish, but like all new Bentleys and Rolls Royces, they're built to order. This one features phone in the armrest, your choice of uh, CD player and a drinks holder. And everything seems to be uh, touch control in this beautiful walnut finish. Now, just a few weeks ago, Alfa Romeo launched the 156, the latest in a line of cars which has staged a remarkable comeback for the Italian manufacturer. Up to a few name years ago, uh, Alfa Romeo was a bit of a, a lost cause in Britain. Sales had slumped, there was a bad reputation for reliability and the dreaded rust. But since then, new designs, stylish shapes and uh, extremely powerful engines and a huge investment from the parent Fiat company has meant that the car is once again extremely popular and sought after in this country. The latest car, well, been getting a lot of plaudits for its looks, Let's see how it goes on the road. Very Alfa Romeo feel to the new car, the sort of urgent, strident, free revving engine that you expect. Slightly nervous ride. It's a car that if you're going to throw around this handling circuit, you certainly need to know what you're doing. So that's SMMT Test Day 98, some fascinating new cars on display and as ever, a chance for the hooligans just to have fun. My latest assignment is an eight-day appraisal of the Jaguar XJ8 Saloon. Live with it, they said. Go and have some fun. Treat it as your own car. Do some nice things with it. Oh dear, this is going to be difficult. That's nice. Very nice. Good grief, there's so much in this car. It's a real flight deck. Lovely wooden leather. I'm going to enjoy getting to grips with this car, I can see. This is Jaguar's XJ8 4-litre saloon. 
using the normally aspirated AJ8 engine. This 32 valve, 4 valve per cylinder block develops a thundering 290 brake horsepower. Mated to a 5 speed auto box and using traction control, it hurtles itself towards the horizon in a blazing 6.5 seconds 0 to 60 with a top speed of 150 miles per hour and costs in the region of £40,000. I've been enjoying this car for four days now and enjoying is definitely the right word. It's a great car to have outside the house. It's amazing how many friends you have when you turn up in a car like this. It's also an incredibly rewarding drive. On the downside, my only two complaints are about the wisdom of choosing those wheels which look out of place in a car of this quality and also the turning circle, which could be tighter. I found my three-point turns turning into five or even seven-point nightmares. By the eighth day, I'd covered close on 1,500 miles in glorious air-conditioned comfort, alternating between the stereo and the fabulous V8 engine noise for company. Apart from the music coming from the engine compartment, my other lasting impressions were of the sheer quality of the car, its finish, the way it felt, and its subtle and understated elegance. This is a British car we can be proud of. Economical too. Average MPG, according to my computerised captain's log, was just under 21. Overall then, a fabulous car, and one I really didn't want to give back. Now where can I lay my hands on the spare 40 odd grand? July 3, 1997. The date won't mean much to you, of course, but it meant plenty to me because it was the day I departed my 30s and, oh my god, entered me 40s. So what does a car nut do on the very day he hits the big 4-0? Well, that's easy. He drives a million quid of the motors, all in one hit. At least that's what this 40-year-old did, purely in the name of research, of course. It was like winning the lottery, only a little bit better because my million pounds with the cars came free of charge. First meal of the day was a Chrysler Viper, which at around 65,000 pounds is the most expensive breakfast I've ever had in my 30 something, or sorry, 40 years on this planet. Uh, the Viper's a down and dirty roadster. Politically incorrect, too fast, too costly, and I love it. Actually, I tell a lie, not all these cars were free. This one, I actually paid for myself. In fact, I bought it for my 40th birthday. A little present to myself for all those years of hard work. In case you haven't recognized it, it's a Volvo P1800, similar to the one that the Saint drove in the movies in the 60s. But this one is the estate version, slightly rarer as far as I can tell. And I tell you, an awful lot of car for the money. And talking of a lot of car for the money, what about this? This is the Japanese built Mazda RX-7 with its legendary wank horn rotary engine, don't laugh. About 25 grand gets you into this car, maybe 30 these days. Great little interior, great driver's car. Legendary car when it was launched onto the market a few years ago. And still a very, very credible car today. Very rare too. You cannot go wrong with a motor like this for this sort of expenditure. I wish I could whip up the same enthusiasm for the Lexus by a Toyota. Well, it's very good, it's very quiet, very refined, but it has a problem. It has no presence, no personality. No thank you. Now, this is more like it. This is the Renault Sport Spider. 26 and a half grand, the closest thing you can get to a Formula One car for the road, but I warn you, you get pestered in this car. Pedestrians, other drivers, women. Oh, talking of women, they like this one too. This is the Mitsubishi 3000 GT. An awful lot of money at over 40 grand, but uh, an awful lot of car too. But for me, it's showing its age a bit and didn't like that interior. Too claustrophobic and uh, 
probably a car that's too fast for its own good. Nice ass, though. Oh, not a bad face on this one either. I've got to admit, I'm not really a Rolls Royce kind of guy. I'd like to have the money to be a Rolls Royce kind of guy, but uh, they're not really my cup of tea, these sort of cars. But I've got to give credit where credit's due. 120 grand's worth of motor, hand built, everything on board. I mean, everything. Even cocktail prerequisites, the salesman told me. And not a bad car to drive as well. I was pleasantly surprised by the driving experience. Mm, I liked it. Curiously, I liked it. No, but seriously, this is a very, very good car indeed. Or maybe I'm just getting old, I don't know. Now this is the car that has turned more heads than any other car I've driven anywhere in the world. Of course, it's the Lamborghini Diablo. About 180 grand's worth of Italian supercar that makes a Ferrari look like a second-rate car, I tell you. I mean, just take a look at this for a few minutes, will you? And just imagine what it's like when you drive down the road in a car like this. Swear to God, people were stopping their motors, pleading to talk about this car, pleading to talk to me, pleading to ogle over the ultimate supercar. I tell you, 180 grand, well, it's almost cheap. Now, this is an interesting one. All right, it doesn't look anywhere near as outrageous or as sexy as a Lamborghini, but this is a very, very special motor car. The Honda NSX. Formula One drivers rave about it. People who can't drive rave about it because it's a great driver's car, no matter how good or bad you are. I know it sounds ungrateful and I know it sounds particularly if you've never driven any of these cars, never mind all of them in one day as I have. A little uh, silly, but I tell you, I think I've bitten off a bit more than I can chew because this is a bit like having all these cars in one day. It's not long enough to savour them, to enjoy them. It's a bit like saying I'm going to spend a day with Claudia Schiffer and Naomi Campbell and Helena Christensen and Elle McPherson and Jerry Hall and several other supermodels. Tyra Banks, that's the one I like. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, it's a bit like saying you've got a day with all those people and you wouldn't want a day with all those people. You'd want them kind of one at a time so you could savour the experience. And I think that the same goes for all these cars. Jumping in them for 90 minutes here and an hour there and 30 minutes there and in one case 15 minutes just wasn't long enough. It's a bit like, you know, I said, like, as I said, having a dozen supermodels in a day. It's a bit like having all your favourite foods in a day just because you like Indian food and Italian food and Greek food and they're your favourite foods. You wouldn't want to eat them all in one day, would you, for breakfast, lunch and dinner? And that's what I've had. I've had for breakfast a Viper. I've had for lunch a Lamborghini. I'm having for afternoon tea this Honda. Oh, it's rapidly approaching dinner time and I suppose I'm going to have to put up with a Mia Porsche BMW M1. I don't know, that's the mine. Well, I borrowed this car, this little Escort, from former World Rally Champion Carlos Sainz. Difference is, he drives it through forests and lakes and mountains and I drove it in a council estate in West London. This is the 180 grand Ford Escort rally car. Ooh. Now this is something a bit special. This is the BMW M1. The vehicle that started it all. Now, it looks a bit retro, it looks a bit 70s, it looks a bit Italian, but this is a true German supercar. The sort of car that will sell for an absolute fortune in auctions of the future. In fact, it's selling for a fortune in auctions today, if you're lucky enough to find one. And I tell you, it was a pleasure, an absolute thrill to drive this car. Might not look outrageous, but I love it. And this, I've got to say, 
is my favourite car of the entire day. The Porsche 911. Forget about what estate agents say about it, what you think about it, what image you portray when you're in it. This is the best car that money can buy. If you've got 60, 70 grand, do yourself a favour, go and buy a Porsche 911, period. Slightly disappointed with this one. This was the Aston Martin Vantage and I was expecting a lot from this car, but uh, I guess I have to say it's not my kind of motor. Again, very expensive, getting towards £200,000, but uh, too big and too lumbering for me. Bit of a barge. Or should that be a bit of a shed? Well, this is a bit closer to home and a bit too modest for my liking by today's standards anyway, but the VR6 Golf is a great little car, the cheapest car of the day, but it can keep up with the best of them. And it just goes to show that uh, you don't need an absolute fortune to get a sort of modest supercar. Audi A8 Quattro Sport. If ever a car proved that Audi have reached BMW and Merck standards, this is it. A lot of money, but I tell you, a lot of car. And at the end of the day, a beetle birthday cake and a million quid worth of motors under my belt. No, it's a day I'll never forget, but uh, I'm looking forward to my 41st birthday. Is it going to be five million quid worth in one day? You think I'm joking, don't you? But don't forget, if you are going to drive 1.2 million pounds worth of cars in one day, you've got to be a driving expert, just like me. <laughs>